Hello there, neighbor. It is I, Spooky Season John, from the crypts of ARTV. I've emerged from a deep, possibly vampiric slumber to reveal to you the Chosen Seven. Musicians who experience disturbances in the form of paranormal hauntings while recording an album. This won't be your average episode of Seven on Sunday. Nay! My pale complexion won't be captured on camera nearly as often, but it's with great commitment to character that I continue speaking spookily as we work our way through this maze of haunted houses that brought new meaning to the term tortured artist. Before we begin, stab that like button and slash the blood red subscribe to get notified when I unveil future content. But for now, my friends, let's take a turn from the fake frights to explore something that these musicians felt was very real. An indescribable ghostly presence that took on different forms for each record you're about to witness. <laughs> On the cusp of worldwide fame, the Los Angeles funk rock band The Red Hot Chili Peppers found a producer-engineer team in the legendary Rick Rubin and Brendan O'Brien. Rubin encouraged the group to record outside of a traditional studio space, eventually landing on a property on the outskirts of LA that he now owns, a home built in the early 1900s that is often referred to as the mansion. It was rumored that famed magician Harry Houdini lived in the same house for a period of time, although many dispute this and claim it was a different building entirely in the Laurel Canyon area. Upon the band moving into the mansion to record what would become their 1991 breakthrough blood sugar sex magic, some abnormalities began to occur. Bassist and founding member Flea brought along his, at the time, brother-in-law, Gavin Bowden, to document their writing process, with some of the mysterious paranormal encounters being discussed in the documentary Funky Monks, as well as their frontman Anthony Kiedis' autobiography, Scar Tissue. Shortly after arriving at the mansion, each of the four core members began to have unexplained experiences, something that quickly led their drummer, Chad Smith, to moving out of the house and driving to the property by motorcycle each day instead. Flea recalled, I was always imagining that I was hearing things at night when I was going to sleep. I remember John Frusciante saying that he had distinctly heard this woman. There was a story going around that there was a female ghost. John later told Rolling Stone that there were definitely ghosts in the house, specifically an apparition of a woman who brought a very sexual atmosphere to the home. He couldn't shake the feeling of spirits lingering after claiming to hear a spirit having sex in the bathroom, but many do question the legitimacy of his claims due to his battle with drug addiction in those years of the band. They later went as far as having a crew of paranormal investigators come by the home, something that they initially felt was hokey or fake, but Flea insists that once they broke out a Ouija board, something made it move around like crazy. Luckily for them, especially the slightly rattled Chad Smith, things seemed to calm down the longer they were there, with recording taking place for just over a month. Both Kiedis and Frusciante had positive experiences with the ghosts, with John going on record to say, they were very friendly, we have nothing but warm vibes and happiness everywhere we go in this house. In 2016, successful alternative pop act Paris were well into the process of writing and recording the follow-up to their buzzworthy debut, White Noise. Oddly enough, the title of LP1 feels fitting, now that we have some eerie information that implies an encounter with something not exactly of our world. Frontwoman Lynn Gunn noted that over 45 songs were written and demoed in the lead-up to what would become All We Know of Heaven, All We Need of Hell, with part of the sessions getting tangled in the mysterious world of the paranormal. Work on the record commenced at Big Blue North Recording Studio in Utica, New York, a place that's not traditionally known for being haunted, which may lead us to believe that the ghostly beings they encountered were possibly attracted to someone in the Paris crew's energy. The band's bassist Brian McDonald explained to the Glasgow Times that they stumbled upon Big Blue North by accident, and after getting settled to record, 
all three of the current members at that time were startled by some strange happenings. It's an old renovated church and is a beautiful place, and the acoustics are amazing, but we think it was haunted. There was a hangout room down in the basement, our guitarist was there and kept hearing footsteps down the stairs, but there was no one there. His curiosity spread to the rest of the group, leading Lynn and their engineer Chris Athens to set up ghost traps to try and prove someone else was among them in the studio. According to their bass player, they would leave small items like ping pong balls laying around in areas they'd felt a ghostly presence in, with them witnessing these items being moved around multiple times. This mostly occurred in the basement room, but the members later reflected on the hauntings more fondly agreeing that while spooky stuff was definitely happening, in the end, it added an extra layer to the album that they could have never made without a little help from their invisible friends. Although this list features several iconic albums, Radiohead's world-shifting masterpiece OK Computer might be the most universally loved record to make an appearance. But something also appeared to the five-piece English band as they began experimenting heavily with their sound in the late 1990s, leading them to record in a studio environment readily known for its unpredictable scares. Radiohead stands among acts such as The Cure and New Order in describing a heightened sense of paranormal activity over the course of recording, a feeling that drove certain members to abnormal urges in hearing voices, spirits that communicated all throughout their stay in the manner known as St. Catherine's Court. Built during the 16th century, it's undeniable that many events have taken place on this 10-acre property, with some possibly having more sinister outcomes, including the alleged death of King Henry VIII's daughter in one of the manor's bedrooms. During the six weeks Radiohead spent recording the appropriately chilling OK Computer, several members experienced terrifying nights, including lead guitarist Johnny Greenwood and vocalist Tom York. Johnny recalled waking up in different places than where he went to sleep, often finding himself in the manor's nursery surrounded by creepy broken dolls and rocking horses. People were always hearing sounds, according to Johnny, yet no one felt the wrath of whatever spirits roamed the property like Tom. Some would say that a visionary mind like his would be more prone to visits from the supernatural, but regardless, the frontman said that the ghosts would talk to him while he was sleeping quite often. There was one point where I got up in the morning after a night of hearing voices and decided I had to cut my hair. I attempted to give myself a spontaneous crew cut with the little scissors on a pen knife. It didn't go well. I cut myself a few times. It got messy. I came downstairs and everyone was like, uh, are you all right? I was like, what's wrong? Phil Selway very gently took me downstairs and shaved it all off. Those unnerving moments happened often throughout their time at St. Catharines, but in the decades that have passed since then, many have realized that these hauntings could have been the extra spark of inspiration that helped push Radiohead to create their magnum opus. Victorious as it may sound, the 10th album Medicine at Midnight by Foo Fighters stumbled upon some ghastly curveballs that made the three and a half month recording process a scary one, according to several members of the band who have spoken out about the frights publicly. Frontman Dave Grohl, drummer Taylor Hawkins, and guitarist Chris Shiflett have all revealed unexplainable details during interviews they did to promote the album. Recording took place at an unknown house in Encino, California from late 2019 into February 2020. Shiflett described it as the old, funky mansion, a crappy house in the middle of a nice neighborhood. Grohl in particular seemed thrown off by the ghosts, as one would expect, telling Rolling Stone that they captured things on a Nest camera they simply cannot explain. We started working there, and it wasn't long before things started happening. We would come back to the studio the next day, and all of the guitars would be detuned. Or the setting we'd put on the board, all of them had gone back to zero. We would open up a Pro Tools session and tracks would be missing. There were some tracks that were put on there that we didn't put on there. Nobody playing an instrument or anything like that, just an open mic recording a room. 
Despite the at times tense atmosphere this mystery caused them, the Foo Fighters insist that Medicine at Midnight is still a party record, a celebration of the band. That didn't stop them from wrapping up as quickly as possible as things got even weirder by the end of their stay. As Dave stated, the worst part is just feeling it. It's not like you're seeing floating bedsheets and vomiting pea soup. It's like you feel somebody next to you, or hear footsteps, or have reoccurring dreams of an old woman in a muddy sweater barefoot in your living room. We previously discussed the hair-raising stay the Red Hot Chili Peppers had at producer Rick Rubin's Haunted Mansion, but the nine-piece act Slipknot experienced terror on another level while recording their 2004 record Volume 3, The Subliminal Verses. Many would call Slipknot a frightening heavy metal band that are scary without any ghosts attached at all. But after their self-destructive sessions for Iowa in 2001, the most terrifying thing they could think of was letting the band fall apart due to their own addictions and side projects. This meant new producer, new sound, new location, all of which led them to record with Ruben at the mansion in Laurel Canyon. They had heard stories of other bands brushing hands with the unknown there, but in typical Slipknot fashion, they recorded there anyways and learned to channel the ethereal atmosphere into the sound of the record. It seems as though vocalists are more of a direct target for these spirits, as once again, Corey Taylor was the host for more of these supernatural exchanges than anyone else in their camp. It began with puzzling equipment issues and freezing tracks in the studio. But things turned more haunting fast as both Taylor and the late great drummer Joey Jordanson felt something not of this world pushing them almost daily. Joey noted that the vibe caused by these spirits played a critical role in the album turning out as great as it did and the way it did, although he wasn't exactly sure what to make of the ghosts opening his bedroom door every day at 9am no matter what he placed in front of it to try and derail the strange ritual. Their frontman agreed, as he said just before Volume 3's release, that house was so fucking haunted, noting that the ghosts went to great lengths to make their presence known. He found the words, in case of paranormal activity, dial this number scrawled on a phone jack in his room, yet that unsettling discovery was nothing compared to what he would find later on. I was alone. The door to our room was shut and locked, the doors to the balcony were shut and locked, but the door to the bathroom was wide open. I was taking a shower, getting ready to hit the town with a vengeance. The shower curtain was open a smidge and could see the room from my vantage point. I looked up. A man in a tuxedo walked past the open door, staring right at me. These mysterious moments and the apparently very hands-off approach taken by Rick Rubin led to their weirdest album to date, one with a more experimental tone, but an album that stands tall decades later, in no small part thanks to some motivation by the, shall we say, other residents of the mansion. Inviting in the darkness may have felt intentional to anyone watching the story of Nine Inch Nails unfold in the early 1990s, but their sole permanent member at the time, Trent Reznor, begs to differ when it comes to the supernatural. To briefly remind you of the chaos surrounding the downward spiral and its creation, Let's just say it wasn't a smooth process, and it definitely wasn't a fast one. Reznor decided to tempt fate by renting a large house big enough to accommodate a full studio. But what he claims not to have known is that this house was the very one where a gruesome murder took place decades prior. Perhaps the name Charles Manson will foreshadow what I'm about to tell you, but in August 1969, Manson and several of his so-called family members murdered multiple people at this very house in Benedict Canyon, including famed actress Sharon Tate. Reznor and those recording with them in the home began to notice oddities, not exactly in the terrifying sense, but rather an unnerving presence that loomed like a melancholic cloud. He told Entertainment Weekly in 1994, Little sounds would make me jump at first, but after a while, it was just like home. The house didn't feel terrifying so much as sad, 
peacefully sad, but that could just be my own insanity. While small connections to the Tate murders may have unintentionally found their way into the downward spiral, like the word pig appearing in multiple song titles, much like it was written in blood on the door after the murders, the door of which he took with him after leaving the studio, the Nine Inch Nails leader insists that his surroundings had nothing to do with the change in sound after Pretty Hate Machine. Reznor ended up exiting the property sooner than expected, most likely due to its scheduled demolition by the city, but some say he rushed to wrap up the album after having a conversation with Sharon's sister. After she questioned his intentions, asking if he was exploiting his stay in the Tate house for his dark aesthetic, it seems the frontman realized that this wasn't just a piece of American folklore, it was in fact a real American horror story. The building across in your size, Mama will all fly. If there's one band you'd easily associate with spooky season each year, My Chemical Romance are surely the frontrunners in many minds across the globe. Some might recall the curse of the Black Parade a phrase that's lived on in infamy due to the torturous stain it gave the band throughout the recording of the album and its subsequent tour. Going out west to Los Angeles once again, we enter the Paramore, a haunted mansion that became a major force behind My Chem's creativity. The Black Parade is a concept album rock opera wielding enough blunt force to permanently lodge itself in your mind, yet the sacrifices it took to get there were traumatizing according to multiple members who experienced things firsthand. Brothers Mikey and Gerard Way were tormented the most, with Mikey already feeling unwell and exhausted mentally as recording began. Drummer Bob Breyer witnessed bathtubs filling on their own, Mikey watched his dogs barked at thin air, and guitarist Frank Iero saw doors slam right in front of his eyes with no logical explanation as to why. Mikey ended up leaving the Paramore for the sake of his mental health not long into the process, later telling of how he unintentionally picked the most notoriously haunted room in the house as his bedroom, which led to severe paranoia. This loss took a toll on Gerard too, as he watched his bandmates battle these invisible spirits while also fighting off night terrors of his own. These became almost daily occurrences for the leader of the Black Parade, causing extreme fatigue thanks to his inability to get peaceful rest, sleep paralysis, nightmares, and waking up screaming violently directly inspired the song Sleep, which features an intro where Gerard tries to explain the terrors that haunt him in his dreams. The curse of the Black Parade affected every member of the band at some point, including Ray Toro, who at one point told their drummer he'd seen a ghost. But the curse wasn't broken when they finished the album. Instead, it seemingly followed them for the entire touring cycle for the Black Parade, as they were hit with everything from horrendous food poisoning to every member of the band, to serious injuries to multiple members on set for their famous Last Words music video, with all of these accidents nearly breaking up My Chemical Romance in the process. Did these haunted albums scare you? Maybe not, but it certainly left a mark on the art and the artist that encountered them. Thank you for watching this Halloween special. I spent a lot of time pulling this video together, as did Hannah, in regards to editing and planning, so please leave a like and join the conversation in the comments below. Outside of that, stay spooky, and I'll see you here soon on ARTV. Ah!